On a crisp Saturday evening in October of 2016, a woman named Amanda Kirk was nervously pacing around her home in the city of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Her 41-year-old husband, Beau, had messaged her saying that he was leaving work and that he would be there for dinner. However, that was more than an hour ago. It was now after 8 p.m., and with each passing minute, Amanda was struggling to come up with reasons why the normally 15-minute drive could be taking this long. As she did, a nagging thought kept creeping up in the back of her mind. Bo had never kept her waiting like this before. After deciding that she couldn't take this feeling any longer, Amanda made a brief phone call to a close friend, who suggested that she try checking something online. As soon as Amanda did this, she saw something that turned her anxiety to full-blown panic. Her next call was to 911. If there's one thing that everyone knew about William Bo Kirk, it's that family was the most important thing to him in the world. He loved plenty of other things too. Sports, particularly golf, football, and softball. His successful career as an x-ray technician. However, no matter where he was or what he was doing, family always came first. Born in San Diego, California in 1975, Bo had a difficult childhood. His father, William, was abusive towards him and his older sister, Claudia, and their home growing up was not a happy one. Despite this, the siblings stuck together, and by all accounts, Bo grew up to be an extremely caring, kind, and generous person. He was especially known for his fun-loving personality and great sense of humor, the kind of guy who would do anything to make you laugh and who would always be there to greet you with a smile. While attending high school in Priest River, Idaho, Bo met his future wife, Amanda Weber. The two became instantly inseparable, marrying the year after they graduated in 1994. In true Bo fashion, rather than coming out to a traditional wedding march, the couple ran out with water guns and sprayed all of their friends and family during the ceremony. A year after tying the knot, Bo and Amanda had their first son, Brian. Their family would grow again eight years later when Amanda gave birth to fraternal twins, who they named Chelsea and Dylan. As soon as he became a father, Bo did everything within his power to make sure that he provided a home for his children that was nothing like the one that he had grown up in. He showered his kids with love and did whatever he could to be involved in their lives, including coaching all of their sports teams. In 2012, Bo got a job as an x-ray technician at Northwest Specialty Hospital in Post Falls. Though the job could be demanding, Bo was proud of what he did, and his natural gift with people made him well-suited to the work. His boss, Mike Lehman, who incidentally also became Bo's best friend, said that he could always count on him to make things less stressful, no matter what the situation. Still, no matter how crazy his schedule got, Bo made sure that he was home every night for dinner with Amanda and his kids. It was for all of these reasons, and more, that when Bo Kirk didn't show up on October 22nd, 2016, his family immediately knew that something was wrong. What they didn't know was that things were about to get more terrifying than they could have ever possibly imagined. What is your emergency? Hi, um, my husband is, um, he didn't get home from work today. Mm-hmm. It was over two hours ago, and I just looked at our account, and there's um, withdrawals on our checking account that he would never do. Okay, are you concerned that he's missing? Yes. Okay, take a deep breath for me here. And you said he was supposed to return home two hours ago? Yes. What is his name? William Kirk. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get this call added. I'm going to assign it to an officer, and I'm going to have him give you a phone call first, okay? Okay, thank you. All right, bye-bye. The 911 call you just heard was placed by Amanda at 9.21 p.m. on October 22, 2016. By this point, she had been waiting on Bo for well over two hours. The last time she had heard from him was when he texted her at 6.50, saying that he was leaving the hospital. Prior to the call, Amanda had reached out to Bo's boss and best friend, Mike, asking him if he had any idea where her husband was. Mike said that as far as he knew, Bo had been on his way home the last time they spoke. That was just before 7, around the same time that Amanda had received that text. Sensing the concern in Amanda's voice, 
Mike offered to go out and search the hospital parking lot for Bo's truck, a silver 2015 GMC pickup. Unfortunately, after a few minutes, he called back saying that he hadn't been able to find the vehicle anywhere. Before hanging up, Mike made one final suggestion to Amanda. Maybe she should try checking their joint bank account to see if Bo had stopped somewhere on the way home. It was this that had ultimately convinced Amanda that she needed to call 911. The bank records showed three separate ATM withdrawals from their account in relatively quick succession. Each of these transactions was for $300. Now, it would have been completely out of character for Bo to make even one of these withdrawals. For Amanda, seeing three in a row was beyond alarming. After the 911 call, the case was handed to the Post Falls Police Department, who started by asking Amanda a bunch more questions. The vast majority of missing person cases that they handled usually weren't serious and were quickly resolved, and that's what they hoped was going on here as well. Amanda, however, was adamant that something was definitely wrong. Even accounting for traffic and the time it would have taken Bo to get to his vehicle after finishing work, there was just no way to explain why it would be taking him this long. When asked if Bo might have stopped somewhere along the way, Amanda said that this was unlikely. The drive from Northwest Specialty Hospital to the Kirk home was only about eight miles, and most of the journey consisted of driving east on the interstate. After exiting, it was just a straight shot down Ramsey Road before turning into the subdivision where the family lived. On top of this, Amanda said Bo knew that they had plans that night. After dinner, the family was supposed to go to a haunted house attraction that was being put on by the local Lions Club. Detectives still weren't sure what to make of all of this information, especially considering Bo still hadn't even been missing for three hours at this point. However, all of that was about to change when they received another, even more eerie phone call. Nine one one. What's the address of your emergency? We have a truck at the bottom of the driveway, fully encased in flames. There was an explosion about ten seconds ago. Okay. Is there anyone inside the vehicle? If there's somebody in there now, they're dead. Okay. Send the fire department out there to help you now. Samuel. You want me to proceed down there? That was no, just blew up again. I do not want you to. I want you to stay away from it. Do not try to put the fire out. Do oh God! Who just blew it up again? No. I, yeah, I, I get, I, I've got them on the way for you right now. Okay. I would be okay. concerned about anybody down there. Okay. The I'm, car, I mean, if they're in it, they're towed. This second 911 call came in at 9:43 p.m., just over 20 minutes after Amanda first contacted police. It was made by a man on the 23,000 block of North Rimrock Road, located in a rural part of Kootenai County, about 11 miles northeast of the Kirk home. As you just heard, the mail caller had spotted a truck completely engulfed in flames on the road just past the bottom of his driveway. Firefighters raced to the scene, but unfortunately by the time they extinguished the blaze, the vehicle had been pretty much decimated. The interior was gutted, the paint had been completely stripped, and just about everything else that wasn't made of metal had melted. Even in this burnt-out state, though, investigators were soon able to make a disturbing confirmation. This pickup truck belonged to their missing person, Bo Kirk. As the scene was analyzed further, other unsettling details soon emerged. For starters, it was obvious that the vehicle fire was no accident. An accelerant had been used, likely gasoline, which had been poured onto the truck and then into a trail on the ground. A number of shell casings were also found lying on the road. Detectives weren't positive if they were related to the fire, but if they were, it could suggest that they were dealing with a violent crime. Because of how quickly and intensely the truck had burned, there wasn't really anything in the way of physical evidence recovered from inside the vehicle. That being said, one thing was clear. No one had been inside when the fire had started. While this was understandably a minor relief, the situation only raised more questions. Who started the fire and for what reason? Was this all related to a crime or was there something else going on? And of course, most importantly of all, where was Bo Kirk? 
Investigators weren't sure. But they did know one place to start searching for answers. Little did they know, they were also about to receive a tip that would point the case in an ominous new direction. By the morning of October 23rd, word was spreading fast across the city of Coeur d'Alene that Beaukirk was missing. The 41-year-old's disappearance had been reported just over 12 hours earlier at this point, but already his friends and family members were outposting missing persons flyers all over Kootenai County. They quickly earned the support of the broader community, many of whom also began to volunteer their time to join the search effort. It was difficult work. Not only was there a large area to cover, but many of the places of interest, such as where Bo's truck was found, were in rural parts of the county that were heavily forested and comprised of rough terrain. Still, Bo's loved ones pressed on completely undeterred. Some, like his friend Brian Johnston, started missing work, unable to carry on with their normal routines, knowing that there was ground out there that still hadn't been covered. In addition to participating in the search, Post Falls police, meanwhile, were busy pursuing any other avenues of investigation they could think of. They started by looking further into what Amanda had told them about the multiple withdrawals from her and Bo's joint bank account. It turned out that Bo's debit card had been used three times at two different ATMs the previous night. The first two withdrawals had happened at 8.34 p.m. at a U.S. bank in the city of Dalton Gardens, just a few miles north of Coeur d'Alene. The third and final transaction had taken place just over 10 minutes later at 8.46 p.m. at a bank CDA in the city of Hayden, a further two miles north. Investigators reached out to both of these banks, requesting CCTV footage from the ATMs. At the very least, this would hopefully show whether Bo was the one who had made these transactions. As detectives were waiting on this evidence, they received another lead. It was from Bo's sister, Claudia, who said that she had some potentially important information to share. She had an idea who might be responsible for her brother's disappearance. Their estranged father, William. During a phone call, Claudia explained that about four months earlier, Bo told her that their dad had contacted him out of the blue on social media. He said that he was sick, but according to Claudia, it soon became clear this wasn't the real reason he was reaching out. While he never said it directly, it seemed like William was after money. Claudia said that Bo was sympathetic and told his dad he was sorry to hear about his health problems and the struggle he was going through. However, he made it clear that he wasn't going to be sending his father any cash. As soon as he did, William lashed out, and the situation had apparently escalated to the point where he had made threats. Detectives looked at Bo's social media accounts, and they were able to confirm what Claudia had said. Unnervingly, this wasn't the only thing that she had told them, though. When asked why she thought her dad would be capable of hurting Bo, Claudia said, it was because of something that had happened in their childhood. When she was three and Bo was almost two, their dad had kidnapped them from their mother at gunpoint. As soon as she heard that money was missing from Bo and Amanda's bank accounts, she couldn't help but wonder, had William taken money from Bo by force? Moreover, was he now holding him for ransom for more? Investigators were definitely intrigued by what Claudia had to say and began trying to track down William. Around this same time, they were able to obtain the surveillance video from both of the bank ATMs used on the night of the disappearance. The better of the two pieces of footage came from the final withdrawal, the one that had taken place at the bank CDA in Hayden. In it, a man could be seen driving up to the ATM in what was unmistakably Bo's pickup truck. One thing, was immediately obvious. The man behind the wheel was not Bo Kirk. The man was dressed in a black ski hat, a large tan black and gray flannel jacket, and was wearing light colored fingerless gloves with black latex gloves underneath them. A black and white bandana was covering most of his face with just enough room left for his eyes. Understandably, this was incredibly concerning not only because it was the best evidence yet that something terrible might have happened to Bo, but because detectives had no idea who this man was. 
Police showed the video to Bo's family, and they said they couldn't identify this man either. The one thing they were able to say, though, was that they didn't believe it was Bo's father. This seemed to be further backed up when authorities got in touch with William. He was all the way in Arizona and had a solid alibi. He also seemed genuinely worried about his son. With no other real leads, investigators released part of the surveillance video they had collected to the public, hoping that someone out there might recognize the unidentified man driving Bo's truck. The tactic turned out to be both a blessing and a curse. Almost immediately, investigators were overwhelmed with tips. Unfortunately, so were Bo's family, who had to deal with a barrage of people attempting to contact them over social media. Many didn't have any actual information, but rather just wanted to speculate and share their opinions about the case. Psychics reached out to describe their visions. Some said that they thought Bo had walked in on a drug deal at work, and still others pointed the finger at the family themselves, accusing them of being responsible for the disappearance. As unhelpful as all of this noise was, there was one name that everyone involved in the case began to notice was coming up over and over again. That name was Kevin Bassett. Kevin was a friend and co-worker of Bo's at the hospital, and was actually the person who had trained him when he had started. The two had remained close ever since, and often played golf together when they weren't at work. A bunch of those that called detectives said that they recognized Kevin as soon as they saw the surveillance video. In particular, they said there was a striking resemblance between him and the unknown suspect's eyes. Unfortunately, there was a problem. No one could actually think of a reason why Kevin would want to harm Bo. This was especially true of the people who actually knew him, like Mike. Mike admitted that, yeah, the guy in the video did kind of look like Kevin, but he said he was the last person who would be involved in something like this. Investigators spoke with Kevin, who told them that he had been on a hunting trip during the time when Bo went missing. He had left on Friday, October 21st, and hadn't returned until the 23rd. Detectives asked him if there was any way he could verify this, and he provided them with some pictures he had taken on the trip, as well as the name of a friend he had been with. While this was initially enough to satisfy police, it wouldn't stay that way for long. As it turned out, the case was about to move another step forward in the most awful way imaginable. Late in the morning on October 25th, 2016, Bo Kirk's friend, Brian Johnston, got into his truck in Kootenai County and started driving north. He was headed for an area of the Coeur d'Alene National Forest, located just a few miles away from where Bo's truck had been found three days earlier. Brian was convinced that police hadn't gone far enough into the forest to look for Bo. That day, he had decided to explore further starting close to where the vehicle had been discovered on fire and traveling a few miles past the official search area, making sure to try and cover as many of the winding forest roads as he could. Brian continued on this way until a little after 12 p.m. By this point, he had driven about eight miles away from where the truck had been found and was on a section of Forest Service Road 437, also known as Hayden Creek Road. He had just turned away from the creek itself when he spotted something in one of his mirrors. He stopped to investigate, when to his horror, he realized what had caught his eye. It was a pair of shoes, just barely visible and poking out at the side of the road. Not just any shoes, bright green Seattle Seahawk branded shoes. The Seahawks were Bo's favorite football team. Not wanting to believe what he was seeing, Brian started screaming Bo's name but he received no answer. After working up the nerve, he walked a little closer. What was waiting for him was truly heartbreaking. 911, what's the address of the emergency? Um, my name's Brian Johnston. Um, there's a missing person. Um, so his truck was on fire a couple days ago. But anyways, I, I, I found him. Is he alive? This is not for what I could tell. I, I, I yelled his name twice. And there's no movement from what I could tell, and he, 
is on the side of the hill. And... All right, Brian, I've got them on the way. Thank you for calling. When investigators arrived, they found Bo Kirk's body lying down the side of a hill just off the roadway. Closer examination would reveal that he had been shot at least eight times and that his hands had been zip-tied behind his back. Forensic techs made a note of anything else at the scene that appeared to be of interest, photographing footprints, tire tracks, and other items that might offer additional clues. At this point, detectives were fairly confident that they knew what had happened. Bo had been kidnapped and killed after being forced to hand over money. Judging by the fact that he was still wearing his work badge when he was found, the when of the crime also seemed fairly obvious. This had likely happened within a short time of him leaving the hospital on October 22nd. Unfortunately, the who and the why behind the case were still a complete mystery. With pressure mounting, police turned back to the one real piece of evidence they did have, the unknown man in the surveillance video, as well as the man who bore an uncanny resemblance to him, Kevin Bassett. Though Kevin had provided authorities with an alibi, the more the detectives looked into it, the more that they started to question it. For starters, when police asked around, people seemed surprised to hear that Kevin had been on a hunting trip. They were told that while he used to go a lot when he was younger, they didn't think he'd been on a trip like that in close to 20 years. Things got stranger when investigators looked into the photos of that weekend that Kevin had provided. It turned out that there were pictures for Friday and Sunday, but nothing that had been taken on Saturday, the day that Bo Kirk had actually disappeared. The most damning problem with Kevin's alibi, though, was his witness. He had handed police the name of a friend that he had supposedly been with, but when they called him, the man said he had never been on any hunting trip. Detectives were convinced that Kevin Bassett was lying to them, and they wanted to know why. However, seemingly sensing that they were suspicious of him, it was at this point that Kevin hired an attorney and began limiting his conversations with police. Fortunately for investigators, it wasn't long before another lead they were working began to pan out. Just like they had with the bank surveillance videos before, detectives with the Post Falls Police had started obtaining CCTV footage from gas stations in the area. Their thinking was that since Bo's truck had been burned with an accelerant, it was likely that whoever had done this had bought a large amount of gasoline that night. All they had to do was look out for any suspicious purchases in the area during this time frame. This theory seemed to be proven correct when detectives received video of a man filling several gas cans in the bed of a pickup truck on the night of October 22nd. The station was not only close to where Bo had disappeared, the purchase had been made just a short time after money had been withdrawn from he and Amanda's bank account, and less than an hour before his truck was found on fire. It was clear from the video that this man was not Kevin Bassett, though it was also clear that he wasn't the man from the bank surveillance video either. This could have meant that authorities were wrong about the gas station footage having anything to do with the crime. Of course, there was also another potential explanation. There were actually two people involved in Bo Kirk's murder. Detectives traveled to the gas station, where they were able to speak with a clerk who said that she recognized the man who was buying gas that night. He was a regular who often came in with another man. She didn't know the guy's name, but she did have one of his business cards. It was for a small engine repair business and included an address. Investigators looked up the information and soon after, they had identified the man in the gas station video. His name was Justin Booth. Interestingly, Justin was a convicted felon, one with previous convictions for burglary, theft, and robbery. Just as investigators started working on tracking Justin down, they received some new information that also had a pretty large impact on the case. It had to do with Kevin Bassett. As previously mentioned, Things hadn't been looking good for Kevin's alibi, and detectives were convinced that he was lying to them. However, they were actually the ones who had screwed up. The whole thing had been a freak misunderstanding. You see, Kevin told police that he had been with his friend Danny McGee during his hunting trip. What investigators didn't know was that Kevin 
had two friends named Danny McGee. Yeah, they called the wrong Danny McGee. As soon as authorities were put in touch with the other Danny, he backed up everything that Kevin said. Everything else, the pictures and the random hunting trip, those were just unfortunate coincidences. Kevin was completely innocent. Understandably, after ruling Kevin out as a suspect, detectives were even more eager to track down Justin Booth. Luckily, they wouldn't have to wait for long, because he was about to come to them. On the afternoon of October 28th, so three days after Bo's body was discovered, Post Falls Police received a call from a lawyer. The man said that he represented Justin Booth, who had information that he wanted to share with them. Information about the disappearance and murder of Bo Kirk. After agreeing to come down to the police station, Justin sat down for an interview. He wasted no time in telling detectives what he said was the truth about what had happened starting with the man who he said was Bo's killer, his former roommate and business partner, David Hutto. Justin explained that on the night of October 22nd, he and David had been out driving to the store in Coeur d'Alene, when all of a sudden a pickup truck pulled up aggressively behind them. The vehicle's headlights were on so bright that he could barely see anything, and immediately David, who was in the passenger seat, got angry. He was so mad that he told Justin to follow the pickup truck, which by that point was turning off of Ramsey Road into a subdivision. As soon as the truck pulled into the driveway of one of the homes there, David got out and ran up to the driver. It was Bo. Justin said that for a few seconds it looked like he and David might get into an argument, but instead, David pulled out a gun. So I guess just tell us why we're here today. Well, uh, David Hutto, uh... Who's David Hutto? He lives with me. Okay. My concern is if the news or anything gets out, it's going to come and kill my family. Yeah, totally understand. You know, you're, you're taking the best step right now, is coming forward to ensure that these people are safe. Right. So, why don't you, I guess, start from the beginning and tell us what happened and how you got involved. Um, we are going to the store. Who's we? Me and David Hutto. Okay. For cigarettes and gas. So you're driving? Yes. Big truck pulled up behind us. It was like right on his bright lights. David got pissed. I pulled over into the other lane. As I pulled over a little while later, he seen it turning and David's still pissed. He yelled, follow that guy. And I was like, okay. He pulled into his driveway. Okay. David said, pull up right behind him. David got out of the truck, walked up to him. It looked like they were going to fight is what it looked like. And David pulled a gun. After pulling the gun, Justin said David zip-tied Bo's hands, then forced him to get into the passenger side of his own vehicle. David hopped in the driver's seat, and they started heading north. Justin followed in his own vehicle, driving for what felt like ever, until suddenly they stopped out in the woods. Okay, then what happened? He uh, took out zip ties out of his pocket. David walked him around the front of the truck and put him in the passenger seat of his truck. Were you out of the truck or were you- I was sitting in the truck. You were sitting in the truck still. I was so freaked out. He told me to follow him to the woods. Once they were stopped, Justin explained that David had pulled Bo from the vehicle. He walked him over to the edge of the road, reassuring him that everything would be okay as long as he cooperated. This was a lie, though. As soon as they were there, David started shooting. Okay, then what happened? We drove way the hell out quite a ways. All of a sudden, David stopped real quick. He goes all out. He goes, you won't have that far to walk, Bo. You walked him over the edge of the road. I remember him saying, keep your eyes closed, Bo, and you'll see your wife again. David loaded the gun and uh, shot him. How many times? A lot. 
I think he emptied the revolver. When asked what role he played in all of this, Justin claimed almost nothing, aside from helping to reload the revolver used in the killing. He said that everything had happened against his will and that he only participated in everything that came next because he was scared of David. Where was Bo in relation to where you were standing? I was still by the truck. You were still by the back of the truck? No, by the front of the truck. Before we go any further, I, I just want to ask, did you fire the gun? Absolutely not. Okay. Did you ever hold the gun? When he handed it to me, yes. Okay, and that was to do what? To reload it. Right after he said, uh, do you want to stay here with him? I said no. He asked me if I'd keep my mouth shut, and I said yes. He walked back over and fired down the hill. Okay. So then what happened next? He asked me where the banks were. He said that when they were driving, Bo had told him to pin to his bank account. He told me to get in my truck and go get gas, and he was going to get money out of the ATM. Okay, then what? Um, I went and got gas. I tried to stay as calm as possible, and he called me and said to meet him back at the house. I ended up following him up into the woods. That's when he stopped the truck. He got out, started dumping gas on the truck, and all of it inside of it. Then he lit it from the ground. Once the truck was fully engulfed in flames, where did you guys go? We went back to my house. When was the last time you saw David? This Thursday, because I asked him to move out. Was he upset about that? Yeah. He did the threat, he normal, you know, making sure I wouldn't say anything. After hearing Justin's story, detectives were stunned. Up until this point, they were convinced that there had to be some kind of deeper explanation for Bo Kirk's murder. Now they were being told that the 41-year-old was the victim of nothing more than a horrifying and random twist of fate, a petty road rage incident that had boiled over into a cold-blooded murder. Investigators still weren't sure if they could believe everything Justin had told them, but in the meantime, they decided to press forward. Using his phone, they texted David Hutto to figure out his location. They arrested him as he was leaving a local Burger King. Shortly after this, Post Falls Police also obtained a search warrant for Justin Booth's home on East Miles Avenue in Hayden. While scouring the property, detectives discovered a suspicious black garbage bag that had been wedged under a wood pile in the backyard. Inside were a number of incriminating items, among them, the gun that had been used to kill Bo Kirk. Testing would later reveal that a cigarette butt in the bag had Justin Booth's DNA on it, while a glove had David Hutto's DNA on it. Both men were charged with Bo's murder. Roughly two months after being taken into custody, David Hutto finally agreed to sit down with detectives to tell his side of the story. His version of events were similar to what they had heard before, with the exception that Justin was actually the main aggressor. David further claimed that he and Justin hadn't just been innocently driving around on the evening of October 22nd. It was always their plan to commit a crime that night. Bo Kirk had just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. We had been talking for a week, week and a half about different ways to come up with money. He had a couple of options that he had pointed out to do home invasions at. That's where we were headed that night when we came across Mr. Kirk. Mr. Kirk came flying up behind us, had the lights real bright in the back glass. Justin started cussing, moved over to the far right lane. And it was just another 100 yards or so. Mr. Kirk turned to the left and he swung all the way across and followed him behind him. And Justin's hollering for me to get out and take the truck. And I did. When we had originally talked about doing this type of crime, carjackings had come up. And it would just be take them off somewhere, drop them off in the woods, and be gone. But Justin's pulled me off to the side and said that 
either he recognized Mr. Kurt or Mr. Kurt saw his face, like not certain of which, but that he had to go, meaning he had to die. Justin stood him up at the edge of the road, turned around like he was going to walk off, and shot him in the back. How many times? He shot him once, and he dropped, and both started making like a bellowing-type moaning sound. He emptied the gun, and I had the ammo in my jacket pocket. So I handed him more rounds, he loaded the gun, and he shot a couple more times. Okay. By that time, Bo was quiet. Following his conversation with police, David Hutto agreed to plead guilty to first-degree murder, first-degree kidnapping, and burglary. In April of 2017, he was given three life sentences without the possibility of parole. Justin Booth, meanwhile, initially attempted to maintain his innocence. He got all the way up to the beginning of his trial before accepting a plea deal at the last minute. In July of 2018, he was given two 30-year-to-life sentences for first-degree murder and robbery. The sentences are set to run concurrently, so he will be eligible for parole in the spring of 2047. I'll be honest with you all. This is one of the most heartbreaking stories that I've come across in a while. We always do our best to try and humanize victims and to focus on the positive aspects of their lives. And in this case, I felt like that was incredibly easy. It was just so clear that Bo had so much going for him and so many people who really loved him. And it's all the more crushing to think about how much was taken from his family and friends. Another thing I wanted to touch on was the whole thing with Kevin Bassett because I personally came away from this story feeling really bad for him. I feel like in general, this is something that doesn't get talked about enough in the true crime genre, if you will, which is that people's lives can get really screwed up when they're accused of crimes that they didn't commit. Kevin actually gave an interview about what his life was like around that time. And it's honestly really sad to hear about what happened. So many people just rush to judgment and assume that he was guilty that for a time he wasn't able to go anywhere without people whispering and talking about him behind his back. He said the speculation not only destroyed his life, career, and his faith in his community, it robbed him of the ability to actually mourn his friend. He loved Bo too, and while everyone else was getting to process their grief, Kevin was treated like a suspect. I don't want to harp on about this too much, because I'm sure most of you have already had enough of this rant. But the reason I bring it up is because I think on some level, we're all here because we care about stories like this. I think it's just worth reminding ourselves sometimes not to get so caught up in what we think is the fight for justice that we end up becoming part of the problem. More than anything though, I think the most tragic thing about this story is the thought that Bo Kirk almost made it home that fateful night. The idea that he was on his driveway just steps away from the loving embrace of his family when he was cruelly and horrifyingly taken is something that I don't know that I'll ever be able to get out of my head. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you'd consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.